We are live at 7 o'clock. I'm Stone Grissom, and welcome to our live coronavirus pandemic special report. Tonight, we have the top Nassau County officials here with us to help you sort through what's going on with COVID-19 in our communities and across the region. We want to hear from you. This is a call-in show, so call us at the number at the bottom of the screen, 516-393-1800. If it's busy, just call back. We'll finally get, we'll get to that. Today, Governor Cuomo released results of the first phase of the state's new antibody study. Now, he says the state estimates that the infection rate from COVID-19 almost 14% of the population and about 17% here in Long Island for some reason. Now, Cuomo says the state randomly tested 3,000 people. That was at grocery stores and shopping centers, locations across about 19 counties. Now, nursing homes hit hard in this pandemic as well. The state health department and state attorney general will be investigating to make sure they are complying with the coronavirus guidelines. And a little under 350 people on Long Island have died in those nursing homes and adult care facilities. And there's some new concerns over our furry friends. Two cats in the state became the first pets in the U.S. to test positive for coronavirus. That's according to the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Officials believe the cats both contracted coronavirus from humans. So this is a human to pet transfer. They say right now there is no evidence that felines play a role in spreading the disease. That's a question that uh, probably needs to be studied more. But now the CDC is recommending social distancing from your pets. They say cats should be kept indoors when possible as well. And they recommend dogs be walked on a leash and kept six feet away from any other people and animals. And a new safer way to pay your taxes in Nassau County. The town of Hempstead just unveiled a new drive through payment windows. Town Supervisor Don Clavin says this will accommodate the thousands of homeowners who prefer to pay their property taxes in person. Now he hopes this option offers a safer and more convenient way for residents to securely make those payments during this pandemic. The drive through booths will be in four locations within the town and open next month. And a major milestone is being celebrated at Huntington Hospital. Applause and cheers today as the staff there discharged the hospital's 500th COVID-19 patient. Hospital officials say that we spoke with, they say that each discharge uh, helps boost the morale among the staff. I bet it does. They also say it gives a bit of hope for those continuing to fight the illness. All right, let's get right to our discussion right now. You heard the speech. So joining us tonight is Nassau County Executive Laura Curran and the Nassau County Health Commissioner, Dr. Lawrence Eisenstein. Welcome, uh, welcome Commissioner, um, County, uh, County Executive. There we go. Okay, you're both there. Now I can see both of you. I appreciate uh, your time. You guys have been working working tirelessly uh, on the front lines as well, along with the uh, other essential workers in the county. Let me start by asking both of you, um, how are you two holding up? I, I, I can speak for Dr. Larry, perhaps. I, uh, can I? I think we're holding up pretty well. Um, it's, it's all coronavirus all the time, obviously. It is um, very long days, seven days a week. It's constant, but Personally, I'm holding up well. I'm concerned about our residents who are who are not feeling well. I'm very sad about the people who've passed away. I'm concerned about the economy. Obviously, there are many challenges and many problems that we're sorting through, many challenges having to do with funding, et cetera, making sure people get the food that they need, people who are losing paychecks, making sure we have enough testing in all of our communities. So. Um, that's my very long-winded answer of answering your question. <laughs> Doctor, I think I should uh, let you chime in as well. Yes, I'm so appreciative of all the employees at the health department and other county employees as well. That this is They've risen to the occasion, working very difficult circumstances. Everybody at this point knows somebody who's been impacted by the virus, and uh, it never ceases to amaze me how the employees of the health department come ready to fight. And this is why you have a health department, to help mitigate damage and, and try as best as possible to keep people safe and we unfortunately hear the numbers that don't go well how many people test positive and how many people pass away but we never are able to quantify just how many lives the health department and other county government saves at times like this but we know it's very impressive so this is why we're here and we're ready for the battle uh, Dr. Eisenstein, you know, and I would oh, just yeah. add, I, I am so grateful. I'm so grateful to our Dr. Larry Eisenstein, to our amazing Department of Health, and to all of our workers here at the county. We have people who are telecommuting. We have people on the front lines, first responders, 
Department of Health, Department of Social Services, Consumer Affairs, you name it. They're showing up, they're getting the work done, and the other workers are at home getting the work done for our residents, telecommuting. So uh, I am so grateful to the people who work for Nassau County who are supplying these really important services to our residents, even through the, pri even through the crisis. Yeah, um, County Executive, I know that when we talk about the numbers, uh, you know, they're just numbers, but each one of those numbers, that's a life, that's a soul. And uh, when we talk about the, those numbers of, of the deaths, that's just, it is tragic and it's staggering to see, uh, you know, how fast this has happened. Because I know in your speech you said it's only been five weeks. There were no deaths at all in Nassau County five weeks ago, and now um, we just have numbers that are, are just very sad. Uh, let me ask you about uh, the new antibody testing uh, numbers that just came out that uh, the governor released. Uh, let me see, the 3,000 people ra randomly tested, 13.9 were positive, 14.4% uh, uh, were Long Islanders, and 16.7% had antibodies. Um, what, uh, th there's no results from that, so what, what do those numbers tell you? This tells us that more people have been exposed to coronavirus than we had previously thought. This tells us that it is very widespread. I think if you do the math, and correct me if I'm wrong, doctor, but for every one positive case, if you extrapolate that to the rest of the population, if you have, if for, one, for each positive case, there are seven or eight who had it and didn't know it or had very mild symptoms. So that tells me that it, we, I would like to see this anti, antibody testing continue so we get a, a clearer sense of how many people have immunity that will help us determine in how we reopen. Do we know how fast? And you know, what's, oh. what PPE supplies people need. Yeah, just, and, and what, you know, what kind of PPE supplies people need, what kind of safeguards we need to take. But to have a sense of how widespread this has been will be very helpful in helping us to plan the reopening, the restarting of our economy. Now, the one thing I, I didn't see in, in this report was a breakdown between Nassau County and Suffolk County. Um, do, we, do we know those numbers at all? We have not received that yet, but the states, this is going to be an ongoing process. This was the first step. I know they're going to start another series of evaluations uh, shortly, and you are going to see that eventually we're going to have tighter numbers that show, uh, and tighter meaning uh, level of antibody, that show that certain communities have been more exposed than others. Perhaps certain uh, job descriptions have been more exposed, and with that information, we can strategize going forward. So right now, the the state just presented the data as Long Island, but I think we understand how big Long Island is and how uh, the geography differs greatly. And you know, Nassau and Suffolk have somewhat similar populations, but Suffolk is three to four times the, uh, the land, so the population density varies greatly. There's a whole lot to this science, and this is just a very first step, but it's a step that's really important. I know this is, a, to some degree, like, like you just said, a tale of, of two counties, but we're also all on the same island. Um, what kind of coordination do you have with uh, Suffolk County's Health uh, Commissioner, Dr. Pickett? Well, Dr. Pickett and I know each other a long time, and our health departments both participate through the New York State Association of County Health Officials. A lot of the efforts are happening in collaboration with the State Health Department, and there has been a lot of regionalized discussion. The fact is being neighbors of New York City, Nassau, Westchester, and Suffolk have been the most hardest hit counties in New York State outside of New York City. And so we, we speak frequently, we talk about what's working and if they have a, a program in place that we think is valuable, we see if we can uh, put in a similar program and they call us for insight as to what we're doing. And we participate very frequently in calls with the state health department, with our association, the county health officials, so that any way that, that county health departments can align and, and push the ship in the same direction, we try and do that. Okay, um, we're gonna take a real quick break and then you get to some of the calls that we're on hold right now. And we're gonna have much more expert advice on how to keep you and your family safe from the coronavirus. Remember, we do wanna hear from you. Call us with your questions. The number's at the bottom of your screen, 516-393-1800. We'll be right back. Welcome back to our live coronavirus pandemic special report. Let's bring back in the County Executive Laura Kern and the Health Commissioner, Dr. Larry Eisenstein. Uh, thank you again for your time. Uh, let's go straight to the calls. I selfishly took up uh, the whole last uh, section, so let's go straight to the calls now. Uh, Debbie, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Uh, what's your question tonight? 
Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for all the great jobs you are doing. Uh, my question is, why can't the public get the proper masks that could help stop the spread so less people would be in the hospitals? Um, and if we're not wearing the proper masks out in public where people are still not conforming to the six feet or wearing a mask at all, what is the safest insert into these masks that would make them much safer being the virus is so tiny? Okay. I don't know who wants to take those questions. So f I'll just go first here. Um, if you're finding it hard to find a mask, you can make your own. And you can go on the CDC website for the best guidance on the kinds of fabrics that work, how to make it. And you see people being very creative. I'm out and about when I go shopping at the grocery store or I go to my local Walgreens. I see very imaginative face masks, face coverings. So if you're, if you're finding it challenging to find one, there are ways and there are fabrics that are recommended. Obviously a knit scarf doesn't work because it's got the wide holes, but you can make your own. I've even seen people make them out of underwear, honestly. Um, Everything is being used to make these. So just check out the website. There's lots of great tips on the internet as well. And I'd like to add that the, the mask is protective of everybody else. And the concept is, to catch as many of the little respiratory droplets that come out of your mouth when you talk or sneeze or cough. And the mask will catch most of them, but not all of them. And that's OK, because the masks are working to limit the spread of disease as much as possible. But it's not 100%. But it does make a difference at this point. We know that now. So put on that mask or that bandana or anything that's going to cover your mouth and nose and catch those little droplets that come out and, and you've helped protect other people in the public. Or, or underwear, as we're hearing. So, <laughs> All right, let's go to the, <laughs> the phone calls again. Uh, Lawrence, are you there? Yes, what, how are you doing? How are you? What's your question tonight? Um, I would like to know how concerned, with all the talk of a second wave, how concerned should we be and, and, and how much more prepared can we be in case of a second wave? County Executive, you want to take that? I think we've done a great job. Yeah, thanks, Stone. I think we've done a great job, Lawrence, in flattening the curve, hunkering down, staying home, making sure that we're taking care of ourselves, wearing face coverings when we're out. And I know Dr. Larry is concerned about a spike, you know, as we talk about reopening society and getting things going again, about a spike of infections. So this is something we're hearing a lot about. It's something we're concerned about. We've been through so much. And now that we're seeing light at the end of the tunnel, I know the last thing that we want is a more infections, is having to do this all over again. So I'm going to kick it over to Dr. Larry. I don't know if you realize this, but he is an infectious disease specialist which makes me very grateful that he's in this position right now. So what are you hearing about what could happen in the fall? Well, I think we have to be very careful. We are being prepared. It's the most prudent step is to be prepared for, for any potential worst case scenario. But the fact is, this is a brand new virus. We don't know. We've been asked, is this going to go away when the weather gets warm? We know how other coronaviruses act and other respiratory viruses tend to not transmit as well in warmer, hum more humid weather. But we don't know for sure what's going to happen if this is going to go away. We don't know if it's going to come back in the fall. People ask about mutations. Well, sometimes when viruses mutate, they become weaker and they fade away. Sometimes they become stronger and more dangerous. So it's all speculation at this point. And rather than speculate, we want to take the measures like we've been taking to protect our residents and let science work on potential treatments, cures, a vaccine at some point. But in, from government perspective and the health department's perspective, we're going to do everything we can to limit the spread of disease, whether it comes a few cases at a time or as a wave, as, as is described. And I think this, the conversation that brought this up is the discussion that, well, right now it's not flu season. We know flu season will come next winter. What's going to happen when we have this and flu season? That's a long way away, and I, I think we'll, we'll put measures in place to limit the spread of disease. It's going to be very important, as it always is, but super important that when flu shot for next season comes out, that everybody gets it so that there's less of a, a risk of respiratory illness that can be mistaken as COVID or questionable. Um, but for right now, I think 
we just have to do our measures to protect our residents today and in the near future, and we'll deal with the future as it comes. Okay, uh, and County Executive, just in the little bit of time we have left, it's uh, about a minute left, uh, are we, is the county prepared for if we have, say, a, a bad storm coming up? We're entering hurricane season with the financial hit that the county's taken. Yes, uh, we have an amazing Department of Public Works. We have incredible people who operate the trucks and get ready, get the roads ready. And we have great workers here. Uh, I am praying that the, we don't have a serious hurricane season. I hope that's all we can do right now, that Mother Nature is kind to us as we put back the pieces of our lives from this health crisis. Uh, but we're here. We have great workers. We're ready to face whatever we have to face, and we'll face it with the grit and perseverance that we've been facing this. Okay. Well, thank so you. Oh, thank you all I can say oh, is we hope for the best, but prepare for the worst. Okay. Yes. Thank hope you for, for the, the best, but prepare for the worst. Yeah. Thank you for the information tonight. I appreciate it. Uh, and take care of yourself, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. And thank you to our viewers for your calls. We'll be back tomorrow at 7 p.m. Join us.